My dear friends, I am going to have a little talk today with a gentleman that I really appreciate and have great esteem for because he has a unique role in Israel. It's Rabbi David Staff. We met a number of years ago in Israel. And I remember that time he was even a candidate to become chief rabbi of Israel. He is the rabbi of Shoham, but that is not what I want to underline today. He is also the president of Tsohar. Tsohar is an organization that I think incorporates over 800 rabbis in Israel. While we are all very aware of the importance of the religious, ultra-religious population in Israel, the majority of Israelis are not really Shomrei Shabbat as yet. And some of, somehow they do not connect directly with all the rabbis in Israel. And I think the Matara, the purpose of this organization of rabbis is to connect with everyone in Israel. So it's someone who is not close to our tradition as yet should understand what our tradition stands for. So Rabbi Stav, I thank you very much for accepting this invitation and tell me something about Tzohar. By the way, I want to tell you something about Shoham. There was a young lady, I don't know how young she is nowadays. Her name is Cheryl Kucher. Uh, I don't know, she was in charge of uh, education in the municipality of Tzohar. She's from Venezuela, where I served many years ago. I, I think her name is Cheryl Kemper. 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 Kemper, not Kemper. Kemper is a maiden name. Kemper is a married name, right. Okay, her late father was a dear friend of mine from Lima, Peru as yet. I knew him many years, many years ago. He passed away a few years ago, but for many years we kept in touch. But let's get back to you, Rabbi. You know, uh, I, want to, uh, I want to share with your audience a story from today. Yes, which go ahead. Means a story that I never told to nobody, even I didn't get the chance to share it with my wife. Uh -huh. okay. I get a phone call a few weeks ago from a boy, not from Shoham, that he wants to get married and he wants, uh, he wants me to officiate his wedding. I asked him if he lives in Shoham and he said no. And so I, I didn't respond. I said, I have to see because usually I don't respond uh, I don't uh, perform weddings of people that are not from Shoham unless they come through Tsar and Tsar has nobody else because Tsar is dealing with over 4,000 weddings a year. And if they are stuck in special event like Erev Pesach or something like that, they, they turn to me. But this wasn't the case. So I intended to say no, but I haven't looked it yet in my uh, schedule. Today, I get, I get a phone call from his spouse, from the bride. And I said, look, your uh, groom called me. I have to look it over. And then she says to me, did he tell you our story? And I said, no, what's the story? And then she says the following story. She said, my, my groom comes from a religious background, but he went off the derech. And now he's completely secular, but doesn't want nothing. He didn't want to get married through the rabbinate. He doesn't want, from his point of view, we could make a party without any registration in the rabbinate. And I am a convert. And I said to him, no way, we don't get married through the rabbinate. I want to be Jewish. I, intend, I converted to Judaism. And I have no intention to get married, not in a Jewish way. And he's, he's coming from a religious background. Uh -huh. So uh, they couldn't, they couldn't uh, compromise. And then they arrived to the hall and the, the owner of the hall, of the wedding hall said to him, why don't you go to Tzohar? And why don't you go to the head of Tzohar, to Rav Stav? And he started, a secular guy, he started to describe to the couple, uh, what does it mean uh, to our weddings? And what does it mean that I'm performing the wedding? And she describes how her groom started to cry and said, well, that's the wedding I want. 
but he was embarrassed to, to say to me. And she started to cry and said, I, it, ple- it tries to please me all the time. And I said to myself, I must please him once, at least. I will get, I will take care of the rabbi and I will make sure it will be a Tzohar rabbi and if possible, the chairman of Tzohar that will fo- perform the wedding. And I felt that for me, responding positive to this couple, A means helping a couple to build Shlom Bayit. Bill B, to show the secular boy a path, a thin path to Judaism, and C, to show a good yachas, a good attitude, a good approach to the convert, that she will know that to be Jewish, the rabbis care about the converts. So all these reasons brought me to the positive, positive answer to this couple. That's an example of thousands of couples that want to get married. They want connection to Judaism. For one reason or another, they don't find the way how to engage themselves to Judaism because the rabbinate, from their point of view, and I'm not here in this interview, I don't want to judge nobody and to criticize nobody. From their point of view, the rabbinate is not relevant. It turns them away, turns them off. Therefore, they want an alternative. And we are an alternative for them, a Jewish alternative for them. Of course. Well, I want to make sure that our audience understands and one look at you, one knows that that is the case. You are not what in the United States is known as reform, conservative or anything like that. You're strictly orthodox. However, a different approach, a more humane approach, maybe more people to people. Sometimes, you know, when somebody is an official of the government, he feels so secure in his position that maybe he doesn't have to go out to the people and bring them. And uh, maybe this is a disadvantage. On the other hand, uh, if one is a rabbi and is committed, of course, to bringing closer together uh, the Jewish people, of course, it's tremendous. What do you feel? Do you feel that Soha has an impact in Israeli society? I wanted to continue your comment. Of course, I'm Orthodox. I'm a, a, chief, a chief rabbi of a city nominated by the chief rabbinate. But I wanted to add something which was very important in your comment. I don't know if your audience are aware of the fact that unlike in America, in Israel, most synagogues have no rabbi. There are no, rabbi, there are no synagogue rabbis in Israel, almost none. 90% of the synagogues do not have a rabbi. Their cities have rabbis. But even if they had a rabbi, most secular people are not connected, not even Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah, to the synagogues. They don't come to the synagogues. So a regular secular citizen of Shoham or Tel Aviv or Yerushalayim have no connection to the rabbi whatsoever. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you, if you are aware of that, there was a survey a few months ago checking if the people that live in cities know the names of the city rabbi. It's unbelievable. Only 5% of the citizens, of the residents of cities, knew that there is a rabbi and knew his name. Most of the people didn't know that he exists or they thought that he exists and he does not exist. Bekitsur, to make the long story short, there is no connection between the residents and the rabbi. Now, when it comes to religious people, most of them know a rabbi or from shul or from the yeshiva high school or their uncle is a rabbi or from the yeshiva where they learn they know a rabbi. So they have somebody that takes care of them. But the secular people are not connected to no community, to no synagogue. So who is the rabbi that officiates the wedding? The officer that the rabbinate will send them. Most of the times they will meet the rabbi the first time under the chuppah. They have never met before. They have never discussed what is important for them. He didn't have the opportunity to inspire them in any way. So that's the crisis of the 
rabbinate's establishment. Excuse me for interrupting you, Rabbi. Tell me, a Tsohar rabbi meets with a couple before before he officiates, or he, he does the same thing? No, there are three fundamental conditions to be a Tsohar rabbi. We yes. don't care. He has to be authorized by the rabbinate, but okay. in order to be a Tsohar rabbi, he has a to meet the couple at least once at home before the wedding. He could never meet them the first time under the chuppah. Mm-hmm. Never, ever. B, he has to show up in time. C, <laughs> he could not charge money because it's illegal. We mm-hmm. volunteer. So these are the three commitments that every Tzohar Rabbi is committed to. From then on, everybody could be a member of Tzohar. Let me ask you, if you perform, if a Tzohar Rabbi performs a wedding, let's say he performed a wedding a month ago, a year ago, is he ever in touch again with that couple? Does he make a very good question? Relationship? It's, a, it's a very good question. Depends on the rabbi. There are rabbis who keep contact for years. They make Hanukkah party or they invite the couples for Sukkot. I couldn't tell you that it lasts tens of years, but a few years, many rabbis keep contacts with the couples. Well, I think that would be a very important step since uh, you want a more personal relationship with the couple and some some type of influence on the couple. Let, let me ask you some, something else a little bit wider, uh, Rabbi Stav. Right now, I think today, I think the government lost majority today and you may have elections again, or maybe a new government is going to be formed. What is going on in Israel? There seems to be a lot of political instability in Israel. And something that I read lately and that affected me tremendously is that 70% of Arab Israelis, Arabs that live in Israel, don't think that the Jewish people have a right to a Jewish state. Those are the, the ones that are benefiting from many of the goodies that the state offers, uh, security, uh, hospitalization. I understand that today, maybe a majority of the physicians in the hospitals are really Arabs. So you can see that they have access to higher education. and everything. Yet, this is a fact. Tell me, what's going on with the with the state? What is going on with the politics in Israel? Look, I could take the next two minutes that you gave me, or three minutes, and to describe all the bad things that occur in Israel. I could take the three minutes and to utilize them to describe the amazing things that are are happening in Israel. So I, I I will say the following. A, we have a huge crisis of governing. There is a problem because the vast majority of the Israelis agree upon 80% of the issues. 80% of the people agree upon 80% of the, of the issues that, are, that could have been in, in debate. Unfortunately, the fact that each one of the leaders of the two ca- camps says, I will be the king and the other one will not have any partnership in, in the sovereignty, in the kingdom, in the government. This ruins up the society, turns it to pieces, and the, the politics represent what's going on among the people. So that's the bad thing. The good thing is, Baruch Hashem, most of the people live together. Most of the people sharing the common denomination between most Jews is very high. Is very strong. Israel achieved and accomplished huge, huge achievements in the last 70 years. We are one of the strongest countries in the world from security point of view, from economy point of view. It's true the Jews have, have an history, a history of self-destruction. And if we would not take our our the responsibility in, in our faith in our hands, we might we might fall apart again. We might collapse again. 
We in Soha, we are not involved in politics. And from our point of view, we keep in good, con good connections with all politicians from all parties. We have our political views, but we have hundreds of rabbis and each one of them has his own uh, uh, political position. I hope that for the sake of the Jewish people, we will not come to a new election because nobody could guarantee that the next elections will bring clear results better than the last four campaigns of elections. So the, um, the equality of, of, the, of the growth of, of the sizes of the camps, of the political camps is so, um, is so strong that nobody could guarantee a victory to one of the sides. <clears throat> but again, referring to the Arab, uh, Arab Israeli conflicts, it's a real threat. I hope that there are those who understand among them that there is only one way to live here, and that's with coexistence. And each one of us has to respect uh, the other's rights. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes. Um, it seems, as you mentioned, that uh, we fight with people that have no, no understanding of the reality of our situation. We well, hope I, to the best, but we I know want that... To, I want to point to something else. Uh, not too long ago, the previous president of the United States, uh, Donald Trump, declared that recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, established an embassy of the United States in Jerusalem, and they started something called the Abraham Accords, where Israel and Bahrain, the United Arab Emirates, now Morocco, maybe tomorrow Saudi Arabia, have diplomatic relations, and not the kind of diplomatic relations that Israel has had with Jordan and Egypt, which were slightly cool. These are a real interchange of economic and other issues. So do you think that eventually the Arab-Palestinian-Israeli problem will be solved through the Abraham Accords, through the other countries that want to come closer to Israel, maybe because they all feel that Iran is the greatest menace in the Middle East nowadays? I'm a look. A, I'm not a politician. I'm a rabbi. <laughs> uh, I'm, an, I'm an expert in the in the internal Jewish issues, not in the external issues. But from somebody that sees the situation from uh, you know individual, my personal eyes, I'm afraid uh, you are wrong, because the there is a huge difference and a huge gap between the Emirates and the Palestinians. The Palestinians hate the Emirates and it's vice versa, almost as they hate the Israelis. Um, the Emirates do not treat the Palestinians in a way that should cause them a lot of love to them. The Emirates are afraid of Iran. Unfortunately, the Palestinians or many of them are not afraid of Iran. I, I think that deep, deep in the heart, they hope for a victory of Iran on their. Um, on the Emirates, on Saudi, and on, on Israel. They believe that they will be released this way. As a matter of fact, we saw that in the time when the Hezbollah from Lebanon attacked Israel, and even Arab villages were attacked, and there were victims among the Israeli Arabs. Yet many of them danced on the roofs, and we will never forget that, that they, while we were suffering and even they were suffering. They still danced on the roofs when they believed that maybe the Hezbollah, which is the long arm of Iran, were, um, has a slight chance to defeat Israel. They were very happy with that. Unfortunately, we have to be aware and to open our eyes and to be aware that most of the Palestinians have no intention to live together with us in peace. And the only thing that keeps us in power and uh, them relatively quiet is because they realize the power of the uh, IDF and not because they don't want to see us defeated. I was in Israel when there was 
the war with Iraq. And I remember scuds were flying from Iraq to Israel. And again, I remember Palestinians applauding when the scuds were coming, even though it could have hit them j just as well. But I don't understand something. I understand that Iran is Shiite, but the majority of Arabs are Sunnis. So why don't we have the Sunnis overpowering the Shiites? As I said before, I'm not a politician, I'm a rabbi. I think you have to have experts for that. But I think that the hate to the state of Israel and to Jewish people creates a kind, a kind of common denominator that is much bigger than the question whether you are Shiite or Sunni. Uh, uh, unfortunately, that is so many a time, you know, the envy, envy, enmity, hate is a very strong emotion, sometimes much more, much stronger than love and peacefulness. Hate somehow overpowers everything and it's terrible. You know, in the United States nowadays, you know, they say that empires go through certain stages in history. You know, they come up, eventually they develop very much and eventually start declining. And we are now seeing maybe the decline of the United States vis-a-vis -vis China that is emerging. It is a country that has four times the population of the United States, also has tremendous culture. China is not a new nation. They are thousands of years old. They have strong families. In other words, we're there's quite a, a power that is opposing right now the, Uni the United States. But many feel that the United States is being eaten up internally by they're occupied with the sex of a person. I know that my wife had to go to a different physician a few months ago. And in the United States, uh, you have to fill out the uh, six pages, uh, what medicines you take under the item sex. There were six options, not to male, female, six. One of them was sex at birth. What do you mean sex at birth? If you are a boy, you get a bris uh, the eight days. Well, what's this sex at birth business going on? In the United States, there is something is going on. And I feel also that the internal problems many a time are much more important than the threats from the outside. And in Israel, I feel also that the strength of Israel is really the, the Israeli people. And even though there are many countries that would not like Israel to exist, the strength of Israel are its people and it's our Torah. So I think that Saul is doing a, a tremendous job. Do you feel that you have made an impact on society? Is there any way of measuring the effectiveness of Tzohar? It's a very good question. We have tremendous uh, projects. It's not, you, we mentioned, we focus today in your program on marriages, but actually we help uh, thousands of Russian immigrants to prove their Jewishness every year. Actually, we have almost 20,000 people a year to prove their Jewishness. We, we officiate thousands of bar mitzvot for regular secular and for not secular, for Russians. We, having, we are running different programs on Yom Kippur, Shavuot, Purim, whatever. I think that we have created a huge impact and we check it by surveys every year. What is the people's approach to Tzoha? What is, how many, we don't measure before and after pictures to see if somebody started to put on filling or not. We don't measure that. Although there are these stories as well, but what we really measure is the, is the attendance in our programs, the constant increase of numbers in all programs that we are doing, and the, the request to more and more uh, programs and projects. So we, we see a lot of interest. We see that, I don't think that you will know any um, nonprofit organization in Israel that um, so many people are aware of his existence, its existence, so many people support him, not only spiritually, but even financially. For nonprofit organization, we get over 60% of our donations from inside Israel. I think it doesn't exist in other organizations in Israel. The Israeli society admires what we are 
and uh, is doing a lot in order to show its concern, its love to what Soar represents. And I think that for many of them, we are the hope and we are the engagement to Judaism. And we keep on doing that every two or three weeks, we come with a new project for secular people in order to find more, point, more places where we could touch them. Recently, we started a project of Shabbos on Israel Trail, where we go with the hikers and we stop with them for Shabbat and we provide meals and rabbis and guitars and music. And, and now we started Kabbalah Shabbat for secular communities and we have tens of communities that participate in that. And every day we get new requests to, to participate in this project. Baruch Hashem, we feel that there is a deep thirst to Judaism, to spirituality. And I think that Soar is becoming an address for most of these requests. So we are very happy and we keep on growing. We keep on Rabbi doing. Stav, you know, there is like the central part of Israel. It's Tel Aviv, uh, Ramat Gan, uh, Kfar Saba, uh, Jerusalem and so on. But then you have the North, the Galilee, you have the South. Are you present also in every part of Israel or just in the center of Israel? No, we are present in every place, but you are right that the capital of the secular, secular, secularism in Israel is Tel Aviv. It's in the, places like um, Kiryat Shmona, Maalot, the people are more traditional. And therefore, because they come from North African background mostly, so the need for Tsar is less um, noticed. We have rabbis over there also, and we have couples over there also. But basically we focus and the, our, the need to us is either from Russian periphery that could be located in Natsrat or in Carmiel or in these kind of places or among the secular, secular people that need our assist, assistance. And these are located in Tel Aviv or in Haifa or in Ashdod, but we are spreaded all over the country from Kiryat Shmona up till Elat. Okay. I just read something about a physician who is also a politician, Arye Eldad maybe is his name, where he said in some kind of forum that in a few years, in two generations, there won't be any Jews in the United States outside of Israel, except for the ultra-Orthodox, because the rest are going to assimilate. Have you ever thought, Rabbi uh, Stav, to do something about Jews outside of Israel. This is basically an Israeli organization. Have you ever thought of somehow going outside of Israel to, to different communities with your message? So first of all, the answer is yes, more than once. And the truth is that we came, not only we thought, we came with proposals, just like we knew how to engage Israelis to the davening in Yom Kippur, although they left shuls for years, and we found ways in the hearts to engage them to Yom Kippur project and to other projects. We actually asked the AIC, we came with a few projects to them. Unfortunately, we what is did the not AIC? Get... What is the AIC? AIC is the American Israeli something organization uh -huh. that uh -huh. tried okay. to make a different kind of cooperations. Unfortunately, we didn't get positive responses from them. And um, we cannot work by ourselves. We, we help a lot American rabbis. We deal with American rabbis. We try to help them how to treat the uh, um, Israelis that are in America. We try to uh, host groups from America, missions from federations that come to Israel. And we s offer the federations to come and to meet with us. Next week, I'm meeting with a group of representatives from American Jewry. We try to, to help. But you know that too, that there's one fundamental condition. If you want to help, somebody wants to be assisted. But if somebody want, doesn't want to be assisted, you can't help him. So we try so far without a lot of success. Mm -hmm. But you have it in mind, because I think we expect somehow that Israel should be the focus, the center that should radiate also to the Gola 
of course. And, you know, even though right now I think that the largest Jewish community in the world is in Israel, it used to be in the United States, but now it's no longer so, it's in Israel. But yet the majority of the Jews, I still think, live outside of Israel. At least half of the Jews live outside of Israel. And it's, of course, we are a very small people. And it's very important that we... Rabbi, is there anything else you want to tell me, Rabbi Stad? I think that I want to see you and I want to see you people coming to visit Israel and uh, to discuss a bit more about what are the issues, what are the challenges, how could we cause the young generation to feel proud to be Jewish? What will make him feel that Judaism is relevant to him? But we cannot base our Judaism not on anti-Semitism, not on the, memo the memory of the Holocaust. We have to create relevant Judaism for the youngsters. And we have to discuss how and uh, how can we um, uh, come with different ideas how to reach out to the secular youngsters to engage them to Judaism and to cause them to feel that it's important for them for their lives to continue Judaism. Rabbi Stav, I haven't bought yet my airline ticket to Israel. However, it is certainly one of my immediate projects. And when I get to Israel, without a doubt, I'm certainly going to get in touch with you, to talk to you, not virtually, but personally as well. I want to thank you very much for this Looking forward. Mitraot, shalom, shalom. Shalom. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation for this conversation. God bless you, give you many years of good health. Nowadays with the pandemic, with COVID coming around, that we should soon defeat it completely and we should have peace between Israel and its neighbors. And above all, we should bring a lot of people closer to Torah Umitzvot. Thank you very much, Rabbi Stav. You're very welcome. Shalom, shalom. Shalom, call to.